Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for this opportunity to support the, the bill as moved and as elucidated by the chair. Mr. Speaker, can, for the 15 minutes, can I remove this mask? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, from the outset, it is important to point out uh, if the consultation could reduce, that the ultimate recommendation of this report is that both houses approve the bill without amendments. And that is in page 169. It is true that there are members who may have spoken prematurely on this, not knowing the conclusion of this report. The report does not recommend any amendments to any part, and I will explain. Mr. Speaker, we were unanimous on the 32 issues that the Chairman has spoken to, except one on which there was a divergence of opinion, and what we did in good conscience was to include both shades of opinion, and they're both in the report. But Mr. Speaker, what we did is that in the course of these consultations, we did identify some minor typos and I will speak in terms of how they are dealt with. It is the role of any committee that is tasked with such work to identify what could be pitfalls in the journey. That we did. If you are irresponsible, you ignore them, hoping no one will notice. And sometimes it has disastrous consequences. But if you are responsible, you identify them and see how to resolve them. If you read the entirety of this report, where we have identified pitfalls, we have suggested how you overcome them. Now, that is what some people misunderstand and think it is sabotaging the report and the process. That is actually facilitative, not disruptive. It is to protect this document from any possible flounder thereafter. Mr. Speaker, especially if one reads the report completely, you will see, and I will come back to this, that at the end, there are only six minor areas, and they're on page 99 of this report, minor areas of typos. Two of them, we decided that we cannot touch because they would require us to put ourselves in the place of the promoters. We cannot substitute ourselves for the intention of the promoters. The other four, in the bill before us, you will see that three of them are actually not in this bill. There's only one, and I will speak to it, and it is quite minor. So I also want to let people know that there are no major issues in terms of inconsistencies or typos, as may have appeared. The fact that we identified them does not magnify them, and they're very easy to deal with. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the nation and this House that the committee was unanimous on all 31 issues, and there was no division between the Senate and the National Assembly at all throughout our deliberations. And you will see in the signature page that it is signed across the board. Mr. Speaker, we were agreed, and even after consulting with the experts, that this is a popular initiative under Article 257. The question of who initiates it is irrelevant to whether it's popular or not, because we agreed that in all the countries where you have popular initiative, it is an additional measure. Constitutional amendments usually could be proposed by, this, by parliament or by the executive. Popular initiative gives any other person the opportunity, but does not exclude the first two. Even this parliament can choose to initiate an amendment by popular initiative rather than inside this house. So the issue that the executive may have initiated does not take away from the fact that it's popular initiative. Mr. Speaker, we agreed that while the role of parliament is restricted, it is not ceremonial. It is not ceremonial because if you look at Article 94.1 and 94.3, you will see that parliament is the sieve through which any thing that becomes law in this country must come. Parliament is restricted when it's popular initiative, but it is not ceremonial. And I will explain that a little more. 
Mr. Speaker, Parliament cannot substitute its views for the views of the promoters. And therefore, Parliament cannot make any substantive change to a document that has come through popular initiative. But, Mr. Speaker, Parliament, on a close reading of Article 94, 1 and 3, has that inherent authority to make any errors, to correct any errors of form or typo which are consistent with the intention of the promoters, which does not substitute the intention of the promoters. So if the promoter meant Article 89.7 and it treats 87.7, which does not exist, Parliament can in discretion correct that. But as to whether we choose or not, that is for us. And it depends on whether that typo has any grave legal consequences. And as I'll show later, in our case it doesn't. Mr. Speaker, we agreed unanimously that in this process, a referendum is a must. And this document must be taken to the people in a referendum. That is agreed. Mr. Speaker, we also agreed that public participation is not perfunctory. It is not salutary. It is substantive. It is substantive first because it is a constitutional requirement. If we do not do it, then the process is in danger of nullification. It is also necessary, Mr. Speaker, because it helps us identify some of those gaps and how to deal with them, as we have. But more importantly also, it helps us make up our mind whether we want to vote yes or no. It helps the country make up their mind whether they want to vote yes or no. We did examine some very specific issues which have been raised as unconstitutional. One is the question of the Judiciary Ombudsman. Two is the question of removal of vetting of ministers and PSS. Three is the question of regulation of professional fees. And four is the question of the manner in which the two-third gender principle has been put in the Constitution. I'm happy to tell you, Mr. Speaker, and this House, that after thorough examination, and you'll see that in the report, and even after engagement with the experts we had engaged with, we came to a unanimous conclusion that none of those provisions are unconstitutional. Some people might find them undesirable, but undesirability and constitutionality are two different things. As long as it's constitutional, if the people agree with it, then it is okay. Mr. Speaker, I want to say this, and I want to say it categorically, and this is where the issue, the one issue arises, constitutionality. Mr. Speaker, as a matter of law, and this is where I disagree with my chairman, a constitutional amendment can be unconstitutional in two ways. It can be unconstitutional if it does not follow the process that is already in the current constitution before it's amended. Or it can be unconstitutional because it results, it results in something that does not accord with constitutionalism. Mr. Speaker, if today there was a popular initiative that suggests that we must exterminate one of the 43 ethnicities in this country, as happened in the Holocaust and elsewhere, it would be unconstitutional, even if it came through this house and was adopted, because in substance it's unconstitutional. Or in this house, if today we decided that the presidency will only retreat in one ethnic group, it would result in that. I'm not speaking to the document yet, I'm speaking to the theory. Constitutional scholars agree that you can have a constitutional amendment that is unconstitutional. Now, what we have done, and professors of law like John Buddy is saying it's not true, but that is okay because that is your view. I am talking about the law. John Buddy, you've not stepped in law school, so just allow me. Now, the, the thing, in our case, there were issues that were raised. In our case, there were issues that were raised about fairness of Schedule 2. There were issues that were raised about constitutionality. There were issues that were raised about completeness. I will not speak to them because they're in the document. But to be fair, because they are equally members, including lawyers, who do not agree with me, and it is, they're entitled, because in law, there's no strict answer to anything. 
There are lawyers who believe that no constitutional amendment can be unconstitutional. What we have done, Mr. Speaker, and that was the midway path, we put the view on constitutionality and the view on unconstitutionality. But what we didn't do, there was a serious push by some of the members of the committee to suggest that we severe Schedule 2 and remove it. But we were all agreed that because Schedule 2 is part of the document and we had agreed that we cannot make substantive changes to the document, it must go with the document. And therefore what it has done is that it has given members of this House the opportunity to look at it and make up their mind. But what's important is it is merely an observation. It has nothing to do with the document itself. For the document, the document must go as it is. As I'm closing, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Speaker, and this is my last point, the minor errors. Mr. Speaker, I'll urge members to look at page 99 of the document where we identify some of the what we call minor errors and typos. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, looking at that list, there is only one typo in the bill that we are considering, and that is in respect of Clause 51. Clause 51, Mr. Speaker, refers to Article 204. The only thing it does not do is indicate that it's looking at 204 sub-article 6. So we have two options. We can either exercise that jurisdiction here and just insert the word sub-article 6, or we can leave it. I want to submit, Mr. Speaker, that whether we exercise it or leave it is of not much consequence. Because even if we don't change it, the very constitution that we have encourages a purposive interpretation of the constitution. Anyone looking at this amendment will see that what was intended to be amended was Article 2046. So even if we don't invoke that jurisdiction that we have for correcting typos of form and error, it is of no consequence because any interpretation because it's very clear, because it talks of the sunset clause, in the entire 204, no other sabbatical talks of the sunset clause. So I want to submit, Mr. Speaker, that it is perfectly in order to pass the document without any amendment, because any typo is inconsequential anyway. Mr. Speaker, with that, I want to go to the words as, as um, appearing the recommendation of the entire committee, which is unanimous on page 169, that having considered the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 and the submissions received, uh, the joint committees recommend that the Constitution, uh, that this National Assembly and the Senate pass and approve the bill. And in addition, which is the second one, that, that uh, Parliament enacts legislation to provide a framework on the processing of a bill to amend the Constitution by popular initiative subsequently. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Just perhaps I think, uh, maybe, you know, maybe you know about Delia Molo, maybe the, the, many people may, may have forgotten that you are a member of the Committee of Experts that came up with the current Constitution, in which when you look at, uh, uh, there's an article that I think should, every member should always have it at the back of their mind. Article 103, about uh, how a member may, may lose their seat. If you look at Article 103 of the current Constitution, there is sub-Article 1 with many paragraphs, A, B, C, D, et al. Thereafter, close 3. Anybody, that's the point that the Honorable Otiene Amoro is talking about, the purpose. If you are to look at that article, would you go, do you say Article 1 or 3, would you talk about Clause 2? Because it doesn't, it doesn't exist in there. <laughs> you just look at that. Look at that article. It's not Clause 2. It jumps to Clause 3. But it was passed. It was passed as a, it is the Constitution of Kenya, which was promulgated. I think, I think it's, it's important that for people to understand some of the issues that, that the Honorable Ted Amolo was speaking to. That some of them may be inconsequential. They are not of, they don't have uh, much uh, import, even if they are led to, to stay as they are. Now, 
because of our members, we agree that uh, we will have everybody who cares or desires to speak, speak to this bill. I will now not uh, use the normal uh, left of Mr. Speaker and, and right of Mr. Speaker because I'm looking at uh, the request. There are 54 in number. And I think uh, my screen shows the first 16. All of them appear to be from the left of Mr. Speaker. So, you know, the early bird catches the worm, isn't it? <laughs> 